that's right so we're now recording and I'm going to um, share Pete's slides as well so Pete you're uh, ready to go okay thanks Helen um, so yeah good morning everyone and thanks for having me along today um, I hope it's worth the while after all the technical problems that we've been having but uh, at the end of the day, it's all about trees for us. Uh, computers are good, but trees are better. Um, so uh, my name's Pete Stringer, and I work for the charity City of Trees. So what I wanted to talk to you about today um, is, you know, the question about what are our trees doing? What if we knew what they were doing? Uh, and what if we knew where we could or we should be planting more of them? So. Those are the two questions really that I would like to explain how we can get a, an answer to that. Uh, firstly, what I will do in this presentation is just a little bit of background about who we are. And then I will talk very briefly about the uh, Greater Manchester Tree and Woodland Strategy, which is the basis for answering the two questions that I've raised. Uh, and then I think probably at the end of this presentation, I would like to make a call to arms um, because we really need your help if we are to start uh, delivering the tree planting at the scale that it needs to be done to achieve the benefits that, that we want to have uh, for the future. So I'll just say kick off. So Helen, if you can go to the first slide, please. Oh, it's about, oh. Yeah, so those, those uh, those are our two questions. What if we could quantify the benefits that our trees are currently providing? And what if we knew where we needed to plant more of them to achieve those benefits and particularly where they're most needed? Uh, next slide, please. So what is City of Trees? Well, some of you I'm sure will probably be aware of uh, an organisation or a charity called Red Rose Forest. Well, actually, that's us. Um, <clears throat> we rebranded in 2016, and there was two reasons for that, really. Uh, initially, when Red Rose Forest was set up in 1991, we were funded through um, the local authorities, or six of them in Greater Manchester, uh, the Countryside Commission, as it was then, which is now Natural England, and also the Forestry Commission. And really, prior to 2016, our funding started to dwindle somewhat um, because of austerity measures. Um, so there wasn't that level of public sector funding to support us. So we really needed to have a look at where else we could potentially get our funding from. So we decided that we needed to do two things. One was to have a, a rebrand, a relaunch as City of Trees, because sometimes a refresh is really what you need to get more people to hopefully sit up and take notice. And the other thing that we did was that we extended the area that we were covering. So when we were Red Rose Forest, we only actually covered six of the 10 districts in Greater Manchester. So it made a lot of sense really to include the other four, which was Oldham, Stockport, Tameside uh, and Rochdale. Um, because if we included all 10, then we could align ourselves with some of the, the strategies at the GM level and it would put us in a much stronger position to put in some of those city region strategic bids to get the funding that we needed to deliver our objectives. So as I said, we rebranded in 2016. We do work a lot more now with the private sector um, because we can't be reliant on public sector funding because we know how uh, finite that is. So we have had a lot more interest from uh, private sector wanting to support our planting initiatives. Some of that's philanthropic and some of it's from a social value perspective where businesses realise that they need to be demonstrating their corporate social credentials. Um, so that's where we got to uh, in 2016. And uh, we've been operating since then and we've been doing our best to plant a lot more trees and, and engage a lot more people. So Helen, if you go to the next slide, please. So, as I said, our objective is uh, to, to plant more trees across Greater Manchester and we want to plant one tree basically for every person living in Greater Manchester, which is approximately <clears throat> three million people. It's not just about planting trees for us, it's also about bringing uh, existing woodland back into management. 
they need properly managing if we want to maximize their carbon storage benefits and also all the other benefits that you associate with them things like biodiversity and also social, uh, social amenity as well and it's not just about delivering things it's also engaging people as well so we want to work with communities uh, and others like the private sector and get them involved in looking after their woodlands and of course planting new trees as well so, so far we've planted in the region of around about half a million trees. Um, our target is to do that in 20 years, so we're already four years into that programme, so not a bad start, but I will tell you about uh, an initiative later on that I hope will demonstrate that we might actually achieve our target uh, a lot more quickly than we'd ever envisaged. Uh, next slide please, Helen. So, in addition to uh, the City of Trees area, uh, we're also involved in another project called the Northern Forest. So this is a swathe of uh, the northern part of England from Liverpool in the west to Hull in the east. Uh, the initiative here uh, with government support through DEFRA is to plant 50 million trees over the next 20 to 25 years. So a very ambitious target. There is a lot of land out there, so it's eminently feasible, but it requires a lot of partnership working. So uh, we are working with other community forests. So that's the Mersey Forest in Merseyside and Cheshire, uh, White Rose Forest in West Yorkshire, and then the Haywards Initiative in Hull and the East Riding area of Yorkshire. So we're working with those partners and the Woodland Trust as well to take that forward and to hopefully achieve that target of 50 million trees, which is, I hope we'll all agree, it's a very substantial target. So there's a lot of work to be done there. We're in our second year now. So we're just in the moment uh, of pulling together our uh, planting program for that. And that will involve not just, we hope, new woodland creation, but also some standard tree planting and hopefully some orchards as well. Helen, if you can put the next slide, please. So really what I wanted to focus on today uh, is the piece of work that we have undertaken uh, a couple of years back and now we're starting to deliver against that. That is the uh, Greater Manchester Tree and Woodland Strategy, uh, uh, perhaps a more public facing title is All Our Trees. Um, and really the, the focus of this piece of work is fourfold. We set out um, a set of actions uh, and objectives that uh, we have identified people that should be delivering against that, working with us to achieve those targets. And that's really from uh, local government, private sector, right down to the community level, and of course, people like Friends of the Earth as well. So we want everybody to work with us uh, to take collective responsibility and ownership for those actions to help us achieve all those benefits that, that we can deliver from planting more trees, protecting what we've got and managing what we've got better. So that is one strand of the strategy. The second strand of the, the strategy, which I won't actually focus on now because it's going to be a main part of the uh, presentation. Just go back up one, Helen, thanks. <clears throat> the second part is actually understanding what we've got. Well, there we go, that's great. Is that the one? Yep, that's one, thank you. Uh, the second part of the strategy is actually quantifying and understanding what we've got and what it's achieving. So I will talk about that in detail shortly. The third part, which again is a, a significant part of this presentation, is about where do we actually need more trees? So where are there issues that need to be addressed that can be addressed through tree planting? How can we identify those? So that will be something I'll talk about in the second part of this presentation. And then the fourth element of the uh, All Our Trees or the Greater Manchester Tree and Woodland Strategy is a section on guidance and standards. So it's providing all that detailed best practice, um, enforceable standards, government guidance, uh, and, and all this sort of advice and support that we can demonstrate is out there to get more people involved in you know making sure that trees are planted properly and that trees and woodlands are managed in the right way so that's a useful bit of guidance things always change so you know we will need to update that at some point but it's a really good reference point for people to get that information and hopefully then utilize it uh, next slide please helen So 
The first part of the two part uh, element of this presentation is about what if we could actually quantify the benefits that our current tree provision in Greater Manchester is actually providing yeah. us with. And the next slide, please, Helen. So to do this, uh, we undertook uh, an extensive piece of work called an iTree Eco Assessment. Um, so we carried this out between May and November 2018. And what that involved uh, doing was um, through random computer sampling, identifying 2000 sample plots, uh, 20 meters square, and sending out a team of 57 surveyors. Now, those surveyors went out there and they recorded a whole raft of information. So the species of the trees, the size of the tree, so they use clinometers to measure the canopy height and spread, the condition of the trees, i.e. were they in good condition, what was the canopy like, was there much dieback, and they recorded this for over 6,000 trees across Greater Manchester. Now I said this is a, um, a, a software tool that uses random plots, now what that does, uh, it gives us a sort of 10% standard deviation error, so that we know roughly speaking that using those random plots that we've got more or less a 10% uh, error for the total number of trees across Greater Manchester. But we also used our existing uh, tree canopy cover audit that was undertaken in uh, 2010. So that was actual aerial photographs from a plane uh, so that we could actually measure the canopy cover that way and then compare it to our iTree Eco assessment. And as it turned out, it was actually pretty accurate they were very similar so that gave us a good degree of confidence in the findings that i'll share with you in a minute we also combined with that information uh, data about local pollution and weather and another a tree assessment tool called cabat which provides you know monetarized amenity value on trees as well so using all that information that was then sent over to um, the US Forestry Service and they run that information for a, a computer program to give us the results <clears throat> of uh, what our trees are, where they are, what species and what condition. And this was uh, the largest <clears throat> iTree uh, eco assessment undertaken outside of the US. London did one but ours was three times bigger on, on the basis of the scale and the number of plots that we actually um, surveyed. And then that information was then broken down to the district level. So that's been really useful for them to give them an understanding of what they've got because that will be helpful in them formalizing their own tree and woodland strategies. So Helen, if you can go down to the next slide, please. So the next series of slides are really telling us what the iTree Eco Survey uh, found for us. So I think the, the most important thing to start with is how many trees have we got? And as I said, we compared this to the GM tree canopy audit and it was, it was very close. Um, so what we found was that we have over 11 million trees in Greater Manchester. And that equates to about 15.7% tree canopy cover. So in other words, how much of those canopies are covering over the surface area of Greater Manchester? So it's not a bad figure that um, the national average at, uh, at present is 16%. The government has set a target uh, to be achieved by 2050 of 20%. So, you know, we, we have got some work to do, but we're not a million miles off. So we're quite pleased with what we've got. Uh, next slide, please, Helen. <clears throat> So this was quite interesting for us. Um, we wanted to understand what the, the, the main species of trees were. And interestingly, hawthorn was the most common, believe it or not, which uh, I was really surprised about. And then in the sequence of, of uh, numerity, sycamore next, and then English oak. So that's really good to know that English oak was up there because they provide so many benefits in terms of things like ecosystem services um, but I'll go into in a bit more detail later on. Next slide please Helen. So this is where we start to get into the nitty-gritty of what those trees are actually providing for us in terms of quantifiable benefits. So those 11 million trees are capturing 847 tonnes of pollution every year. So this demonstrates why the trees are so important, why we need to protect them, 
and why we need to plant more of them. So they're, they're trapping things like particulate matter on their leaves and they're taking some of the noxious gases out of the air into the, the stomata with inside the leaves. Not huge amounts, but it is still beneficial. And one of the things that the trees can really achieve as well is they create obstacles to the pathway of polluted air. So what that effectively does, it forces the air upwards and then it starts to cause that polluted air to become mixed with other cleaner air and diluted. So the exposure levels to that air are reduced. And if you can imagine that tree in the slide there, if you were standing on the left hand side of that tree, then effectively what that would be doing is creating a cleaner pocket of air behind the tree. So that's another reason why we need to think about where we focus our tree planting, because it can create barriers to the tree pollution as well as removing some of the pollution as well. Uh, next slide, please, Helen. Now, <clears throat> flooding is obviously becoming more and more of a prevalent issue as a result of climate change, and trees do play a really important part in that. So you can see from this slide here that trees every year in Greater Manchester intercept over one and a half million cubic metres of surface water runoff. Now they're capturing that in their canopies, they're allowing water to get into the ground where the roots have penetrated and created up uh, gaps and fissures in the ground and they're utilising that water as well of course and then transpiring it back into the atmosphere. So trees really do have a significant role in uh, actually helping to reduce, reduce surface water runoff, that type of flooding. And if we place them in the right locations in the upper catchment area, so where our rivers start, they can also intercept rainwater there as well and stop some of that rainwater getting into our river systems, which can help to reduce flooding down catchment where our big populations are centered. So they can address surface water runoff to stop that pluvial or surface water flooding, but they can also help to reduce fluvial river-based flooding by planting in the right locations. Uh, next slide please, Helen. Of course, we're all very, very focused on carbon because carbon dioxide uh, is one of the major contributors to greenhouse gases. So um, we need to make sure that we can plant as many trees and protect and manage those existing trees as well as we can, because as you can see from this figure here, that our Greater Manchester tree population is uh, sequestering or locking up 56,000 tonnes of carbon each year. And if you look at that in terms of the ongoing lockup of carbon, so the accumulated lockup of carbon, that's over one and a half million tonnes stored um, at present. So, you know, not an, uh, an insufficient figure to actually make a difference, but we do obviously need to do a lot more planting to maximise that opportunity. Uh, next slide, please, Helen. So, uh, some of you I'm sure will have heard about natural capital, which is putting a monetized value against the ecosystem services that trees can provide. And so this is what the iTree Eco has allowed us to do for those three measures. So uh, addressing air pollution, reducing surface water runoff and locking up carbon. And then you can see from that, the value of that uh, combined service. And it's just for those three things. It doesn't take into account things like moderating temperature as well and all the, the health benefits that we get from uh, trees as well. So it's, it's just three areas. So that is a significant figure. That's 33 million pounds worth of benefits provided just in terms of those three functions that trees provide. So you can see this is really important for us to tell a story to the policy makers, to the politicians and to the funders as to why we need more trees because we can demonstrate there is a, a measurable value against that. Uh, next slide please Helen. Of course what we found through looking at uh, the species is a, an understanding of what the tree uh, species breakdown is for Greater Manchester <clears throat> and what we have found is around about a million uh, ash trees and horse chestnut trees and both of those are at serious risk from ash dieback and horse chestnut bleeding canker and that's a bit worrying because we have the potential I'm afraid to lose up to a million trees uh, over the next say 10 to 30 years time 
Um, some of the ash trees are showing some resilience, so they're not all going to die, but we will lose quite a significant proportion of them. And um, people like the Woodland Trust and the Forestry Commission, you know, are working together to see how we can breed more resilient strains of ash trees. So I think we hope that in the future we'll find a solution to, to that problem. Because obviously some of you I'm sure will remember um, the loss of elms through Dutch elm disease, but we never managed to find a, a real replacement for the English elm, which was a huge shame. They do still exist in certain far flung locations in the UK, but I don't think we'll ever see them back at the level that they used to be. So we do hope that we can find a solution to uh, not having to lose all our ash trees or at least being able to stock more res resilient varieties. Uh, next slide, please, Helen. So that is just really, I hope, to show people that uh, we've done a bit of work that can be used then by others to show why it's important that we have more trees and why it's important that we manage our trees effectively so that they carry on providing all those benefits. So really the next part of the strategy that I wanted to focus on is, well, great, we know what trees can do, but where do we actually need to plant more of them to achieve the biggest benefits or address some of the deficiencies in the ecosystem services that trees can provide? So <clears throat> this is really now where I want to go, is, is looking at a piece of work that we did, a mapping exercise using different data sets to show where we should be focusing our tree planting and where potentially it actually can happen. So Helen, if you can go to the next slide, please. So the first thing that we needed to do to understand really what types of data that we should be accessing is looking at what the key benefits the trees can provide. So we've already mentioned that in part, <clears throat> uh, we've talked about air quality, climate regulation, primarily of looking at things like uh, moderating temperature during heat waves there. Biodiversity is a big one. It's absolutely crucial at the moment. Um, people like Natural England are looking at uh, nature recovery networks and there is a pilot in Greater Manchester that's going to be happening uh, over the next few years. Trees have a huge impact on people's health and well-being, both on the uh, psychological side and the physiological side. It's great, isn't it? Just walking into a woodland or looking at trees, you really, I think, find a tangible impact of <clears throat> how that makes you feel. But also trees are good for the economy as well. Um, we need to get more trees in our city centres because people prefer to shop in places where they have a better quality environment. And there's some good data out there that, that backs that up. Uh, people like Dr. Kathleen Wolfe uh, from the University of Washington in America has done some really good work on quantifying the impact on businesses that trees can provide. I think most people will be aware of or probably even been to the Las Ramblas in Barcelona with that central reservation of trees in that uh, commercial area and you can see how popular that is with people so we really need to get more trees planted in our commercial areas. Also in terms of improving place we need to look at where the deficiencies are for, for residential areas as well because there is environmental inequity, there's a lot of imbalance about tree cover People will be aware of the very leafy, uh, well-off suburbs, but unfortunately that's not replicated across the board in Greater Manchester and everywhere in the UK. And then also we've mentioned things like water quality and flood management uh, in the previous evidence-based uh, assessment work that we just talked about. Uh, Helen, next slide, please. So <clears throat> through our mapping work, we've used um, uh, Ordnance Survey Master Map as the basis for identifying uh, the areas where we can be focusing our tree planting uh, and we want to take that down to the pavement scale because if we're talking about tree planting it's all very well and good to say this area but we need to be very detailed about this so what the OS base maps are really important for us as the means for actually representing the data that we uh, have sourced for this piece of work. Uh, Helen next slide please. So as part of this work, we needed to actually define what was a plantable uh, place, a uh, space of land where we can actually physically do this. Um, <clears throat> we decided, and, and it, uh, I suppose it's our own decision really on, on this one, that um, a plantable parcel of land needs to be at least seven meters squared. 
Now that was based on the area that we feel you need to accommodate a, a tree on a street, for example. Um, <clears throat> and that is something that we've set ourselves really because street tree planting comes in various guises, but street trees do need a lot of room. You need to put in big tree pits. So we didn't want to put a meter squared because I think that would be, I think, inaccurate in terms of what a tree needs in a, a high street environment to actually survive and flourish and be sustainable. So we set that target as being a little bit higher than perhaps some would actually say is necessary, but <clears throat> I think really for us it's about quality at this moment in time to make sure if we do plant street trees they're actually going to survive and do well. So the other sites that we've excluded from this uh, assessment work are railways, obviously we can't plant trees on the railway lines, uh, on roads and on buildings and structures. We've excluded private gardens and that doesn't mean to say that they can't be planted in, they can, but that is a separate piece of work, we think, because there needs to be a strategy there for actually how we plant trees in gardens and what type of trees we should be planting in gardens. We don't want to encourage people just to start planting trees in gardens if they're not appropriate trees. We've got to get that right. And we have been doing some work with one of the social housing providers as a pilot to actually start rolling that out amongst their housing stock. So there's a separate piece of work there that can be done. Gardens are really crucial, but we've got to get it right to make it sustainable. Obviously existing woodlands we've excluded because there's trees already there, but of course existing woodlands do need interventions. They need thinning work and they need more, I suppose, beneficial tree species going in there that provide a greater level of ecosystem services. We've excluded historic parts and gardens, but that doesn't mean to say that they can't accommodate some tree planting because some of them will have uh, what we call, I suppose, tree scapes, where they have the bigger individual trees. It's not excluding them, but we wanted to, I think, focus on the areas that we thought were more deliverable in the short term. So we're not ruling those out, but for the benefit of this piece of work, they weren't included. <clears throat> Likewise, uh, triple, triple SI, so site special scientific interest. Uh, we can't, as much as we'd like to, plant trees absolutely everywhere because some sites are very important for, for other biodiversity uh, requirements. So, for example, we wouldn't tree, uh, plant trees in an acid rich um, uh, grassland or a wildflower meadow area or a peatland bog, and you've got that down below as a blanket bog because blanket bogs are really, really crucial. They lock up more carbon than trees and also they have a very, very big impact on managing water as well. So we wouldn't be planting trees on those. Also, you'll see there we've excluded high grade agricultural land and that means grade one farmland and grade two farmland because obviously they are very productive and provide an important source of food but there is a lot of uh, low-grade farmland out there which <clears throat> is considered to be appropriate for planting trees on a, a, a more detailed investigative level so we've included you know the probably grade threes and fours and fives and then of course unfortunately and i'm sure some of you will probably boo at this one but we can't plant trees around uh, an airport um, because of the issues about planes coming in and, and, and radar and so forth and so on so we have to exclude that one, unfortunately. Um, next slide, please, Helen. <clears throat> so this is just um, a map uh, that's showing uh, some of the areas of plantable land, and it can actually include hard landscaped areas. So there's nothing to stop us really saying that we shouldn't be planting trees on car parks. I think if you go to most supermarkets, they have got some trees there, but we could plant a lot more of them. So we haven't excluded car parks. We certainly haven't excluded public squares. Um, we can get more trees in there. And if you go into Manchester, you will have seen outside uh, the town hall there, they've put some very interesting trees in there, foxglove trees. So that's a good example of what you can do there. Um, and also pavements as well. Um, Street trees are really, really important in places where you haven't got green space. We need to give people uh, vistas of street trees because it has an impact on uh, psychological well-being, as I mentioned, and also it can have an impact on air quality. So we certainly haven't ruled out uh, areas of hard landscaping. They are in there as well, but obviously not roads. Uh, Helen, next slide, please. So then 
what we've done, we've um, sourced uh, data sets that uh, enable us to understand where tree planting should be focused. So, for example, you'll see air quality. So we've managed to source data that shows what uh, particulate levels might be associated with a particular place. If you've got climate regulation, what we've done there is we've mapped out all the hard surfaces which absorb heat. So that's our urban heat island effect. So we know there's a potential issue there. And that's where things like street trees can play a role. Um, <clears throat> we've also mapped out areas where potentially you can expand existing woodlands, create nature recovery networks. We've also mapped out the active travel routes as well, because we need more trees along those to make them better places for people to walk and cycle, more attractive places. We've looked at well-being, uh, and that also that includes, like I mentioned before, where you've got deficiency in tree canopy cover relating to areas of multiple deprivation. We've also mapped development sites. We're saying that trees should be planted adjacent to the development sites or incorporated within those footprints wherever possible. Retail areas, like I mentioned before, trees are good for the economy. They encourage more people to, to shop in those areas. And of course, residential streets. We want street trees. So uh, it's important for us to actually map those pavements that are wide enough. And what we've done is set a target of pavements over 2.5 meters wide, which are wide enough to accept street trees and allow people to get past wheelchair users and prams and so on. And also we've used flooding data from the local authorities and the environment agency to show where we've got issues of both um, fluvial flooding and pluvial flooding. So that's river based and surface water flooding. And so we've used all those data sets then to start mapping out where the problem areas are. And then we've also mapped out where the potential planting space is and overlaying that to show what we could potentially do it's a high level assessment, of course, because it's not actually taking into account who owns those uh, parcels of land, but it's, what it's merely saying is these places need interventions uh, because there are particular underlying issues at the moment with things like we said, air quality or, ex or uh, vulnerability to urban heat island or flooding and so on. Uh, next slide, please, Helen. <clears throat> So this is just a, a map um, that shows um, the, the modelled uh, particulate matter 2.5 data. So that's uh, showing us where that uh, level of pollution exceeds 10 micrograms per cubic metre of air. So which is obviously you know, in a, a unacceptable from a, a health perspective. So you can see a lot of that. And you look at the Manchester one, you can see that's very close to the city centre. Um, and the, the main routes into the city centre. So that's telling us, you know, there are specific locations where air quality is failing standards and that we need to do something to address that. So the next slide, please, Helen. Is that not the one, Pete? So that's the one, yeah, yeah. So, so what we've done here, we've honed down to, to the more neighborhood scale level and what that is showing there is you can see the big brown splurge the big nicotine stain that's where the pm 2.5 exceeds the 10 uh, micrograms per cubic meter of air <clears throat> so there's a problem there we need to do something the light green areas are all potential plantable locations so that could be things like um, green spaces it could be things like car parks, it could be locations like streets where the pavements are wide enough. So that's mapped out all those plantable locations where we can put trees in that can have a demonstrable impact on improving air quality by either capturing it or causing it to, to dilute through forcing it upwards and mixing it with cleaner air and creating those cleaner pockets of air behind the trees. The darker green is actually a school or around a school and children uh, are really vulnerable to, to asthma. So we've seen that as a priority location. We're, we're saying trees should be planted around that school because it will provide shielding benefits to, to the children at the school. So you can see straight away, I think what we're doing here, we've mapped the problem and we've mapped the locations where trees could be planted to help address that problem. 
Next slide, please, Helen. So this next slide is focusing on um, urban heat island effect or vulnerability to it. Vulnerability to it. And these are, are modelled um, temperature rises uh, up until 2050. Um, so it's obviously showing that things are going to get hotter. Um, you know, our summers are wet or wetter, but we do get those really intense episodes of heat, which can be very, very problematic for, for people that have things like respiratory issues. Um, so we need to be doing something that will enable uh, some degree of temperature moderation to be achieved when those extreme heat episodes actually happen. So that's mapping all those vulnerable areas. So Helen, if you can go to the next slide, please. So then what we've done again, like we did with air quality, is we've actually identified all the potential planting locations, all the green spaces, and you can see the red areas where the, the temperatures, the high temperatures are. So that's telling us that we can do things like you know, potential woodland creation on the green spaces, or we can plant street trees on streets, and that will help to provide some uh, temperature moderation benefits through things like canopy shading or evaporative cooling. So that again i think i hope demonstrates that we try to look at this at a very detailed level to show where trees can really provide a benefit next slide please helen so what this slide is saying is that <clears throat> these are locations where there is the potential to plant uh, new woodlands taking into account all the constraints that I mentioned previously. So, you know, not planting on um, the upland or the lowland peatland box, for example, or not planting on triple SIs. You'll also see on the slide, it actually says planting opportunities that are greater than 500 meters from existing woodland. Now, the reason why we've put that in is if you plant a new woodland within uh, 500 meters of an existing woodland, potentially, you will then have to submit an environmental impact assessment to the Forestry Commission. That basically means that they want to make sure that if we are planting woodlands in those areas, that we're not doing anything that might have a negative impact on an existing habitat space. Um, so it's just a, a mechanism for making sure that we're planting woodlands in the appropriate areas. It doesn't mean at all that we can't plant woodlands within 500 meters of an existing woodland but it's another layer another layer of I suppose assessment to determine whether it's suitable so what we've done here is just actually focused on those locations where you haven't got five uh, woodlands within 500 meters so they're the much easier options to go at because that there isn't that same level of assessment and scrutiny I suppose they're the lower hanging fruit if you like uh, next slide please Helen Okay, so I mentioned earlier about flooding. Uh, it's going to come, well, it's already here. It's becoming a more and more prevalent issue. Um, we're getting many more high rainfall, high intensity events that's leading to flooding episodes, not just in, in West Yorkshire, as we know about Hebden Bridge and Tobinden and so on, but we're also getting it in Greater Manchester as well. Um, some of you will probably remember the Boxing Day floods. Uh, in uh, Greater Manchester and I think it was 2015. Uh, I remember seeing um, the, the River Irwell in Manchester city centre next to the Lowry Hotel burst its banks and was lapping up to um, the steps of the Lowry Hotel. So it really is a, a real threat even to the places that we probably considered wouldn't be vulnerable to flooding. So one of the things that's really important for helping to address the amount of water going into the rivers is to get planting along uh, the embankments of the areas adjacent to the river. So that's called riparian planting. So you can see on here, we've got two um, markers. We've got a light blue and a dark blue. So the light blue areas are where we can get trees uh, adjacent to rivers, and that's important per se. So that's uh, something we should be doing. 
where you've got the dark blue, those are locations where if we plant trees adjacent to rivers, then we can have more of an impact on reducing vulnerability to communities that have been identified by the environment agency as being at risk of flooding. So I suppose they're, they are more of priority locations because you know there are people downstream of those places that are going to be uh, you know vulnerable to flooding. Doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be doing all of it though, but it's just a way for us to get a scoring system to say, let's try and focus on these places as a matter of urgency. Next slide, please. And again, this is just saying uh, in the, the wider catchment of those river catchments, places like the floodplains, where we can get more trees that will help again intercept some of that water. So this isn't right next to the rivers, it's in the areas that flood around them. And again, you can see there's two scores there, one and a two, the two being the priority because those are areas where you've got communities at risk of flooding. So it's just about really, as I say, trying to focus on where we need to do things more urgently. You know, in general, we need to do all of it, but there are some things that should be done sooner rather than later. Yeah, next slide, please, Helen. And this is quite a technical table, this, so I won't go into levels of detail, but based on those maps, you can see there are scores assigned. So cumulatively, for all those different benefits that tree planting could achieve in those locations where there are particular issues identified, we've given planting opportunities a collective score, so a priority score. So if you go to the next slide, Helen, you can see that represented in a heat map. So those combined scores um, can give us a total score for planting location of up to 11. So the really dark red areas are what we consider to be the priority locations for planting more trees. These are where we should really be focusing our efforts. Next slide, please, Helen. And this is just then showing that collective scoring, that priority scoring uh, at a more localized level. So you can see that at the neighborhood level. So you can see where those number one priority locations are, i.e. The, the red locations. So this is the nature of this mapping. We, we have gone down to the very detailed level. Uh, next slide, please, Helen. So this link is in here uh, because it can then take you to where the mapping sits on mapping GM. So that's free data access. And what you can then do is actually go onto those maps and you can go down to the really, really detailed site level to see where our planting locations have been identified, i.e. our priority planting locations and of course then collectively all our locations. So if you go to the next slide please Helen. So this is just showing you when you go on to uh, mapping GM, that's what you'll get. You'll get a menu and you'll see the top one there that says environment and ecology. So if you go down to the next slide please Helen. And then you can see you're on the um, environment and ecology tab and then that's taking you to tree planting opportunities. So that's where you can start to interrogate, you can turn layers off and on, you can zoom in and out. So you can really start to see where and potentially if you're living in that area where we need to see more trees planted. So that gives you an opportunity I hope to start working with partners, start lobbying for more trees to be planted in these places. Uh, next slide please Helen. Um, we think this is particularly important, as I mentioned earlier on, that we get that environmental equity because at the moment not everybody gets access to trees and green space. So uh, we want to work with social housing providers and this is just a map showing some of the land that they have and, and places where trees should be planted uh, to address particular issues. Next slide please. And then because uh, obviously local authorities are big landowners, then uh, providing that information to them or, or them being able to access that information is really important if they want to develop their local green space or tree strategy. So it's a good source of information for them to start thinking about their planting objectives. 
Next slide, please, Helen. So this mapping work really, I, I hope, or we all hope at City of Trees is, is very useful and beneficial to a whole range of disciplines. And you can see we've identified some of those there. Obviously, we've got developers in there. We really hope that developers will use this because I think, you know, if they can demonstrate to the planning authority that they are taking notice of some of the local issues that potentially could be addressed through trees and green infrastructure, that might make that their, their case better, really, for, for when planning applications are considered, if they've shown that they're trying to do the best they can in terms of improving local environment to address those very specific benefits. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, um, I think using this natural capital approach, so putting a quantifiable monetized value against the benefits of trees is really important because decision makers and policy makers and politicians do like to see uh, how our investment stacks up in terms of the benefits that we get back. So we need to start using that approach. So that approach of natural capital and ecosystem services. And because obviously funding is not infinite we need to focus on where we can get the most bang for our buck so where can the tree planting achieve the most benefits and i think probably that's the approach that we need to take now obviously i think we all agree that we need to plant as many trees as we can in, the, in appropriate locations like i said there are some places where it isn't appropriate but we do need to increase our tree cover so i think really that's the philosophy is using that approach to demonstrate value and then showing where we need to focus our efforts. So there's just a, obviously a link to uh, that piece of work, all our trees. You can go onto our website and read that strategy and that provides more detail. And then of course there's our uh, website link there as well. But before I finish, I just wanted to, I suppose, put a call out to arms really for you guys to, to help us. We're in the midst of um, developing a programme of planting now for the next five years. We've made a submission to central government uh, to their Nature for Climate Fund, um, which we're waiting for a decision on. Uh, if that is successful, then that would potentially support the planting of a thousand hectares of trees across Greater Manchester over the next five years. So that's somewhere in the region of around about two to two and a half million trees. Now, that's great. If that funding bid comes off and we will know about that by the end of October, then we're in a brilliant position because we will have the funding there to plant trees. But of course, the big problem is we haven't got access to all of that land to plant the trees. So it's people like Friends of the Earth, I hope, that, that might be able to help us either identify places for planting more trees or perhaps do some lobbying work to get um, landowners to, to support this initiative because the funding is there to plant the trees, it would actually pay for the planting and then the establishment work. So, you know, it's really important now going forward that we start to identify genuine places that we can plant that we've got permission to do that. So I think that would be my, my parting request to yourselves is, can you help us with that? And, and obviously please do get in contact with us if you would like to discuss that in more detail. Thank you. Okay, so um, we've only got about three minutes before the next session starts. And I know Ali will probably have disappeared off um, and I'm supposed to be putting his comments and stuff in the box, but I'm here still. But um, I'm glad everybody managed to get over and I know some of you were quite, took a, a bit of time to get over through to Zoom. So um, sorry if that was because of the change of platform, but we have recorded this. So I'm just gonna uh, fire some questions at Pete quite quickly and any that we don't get answered, um, we will um, we'll try and see if Pete's got some time to answer them and get them on the website. And um, we will get the PowerPoint as well on the website uh, post event. But very quickly, Pete, just, I just wanna ask you a question before I forget. Um, we have had Mersey Forest on bef uh, before, which is the, uh, the area that I live in so I'm from Greater Manchester but I've been in Chester for sort of 25 years or something like that now um, do you know whether they're planning to do anything similar because that's that is fantastic data that you've done there um, yeah I mean they, they, they will have, in terms of the data that they haven't got that strategy but they will have identified planting locations and, and what they're currently doing like ourselves because they're part of that collective bid to DEFRA they are compiling locations now for planting um, over the next five years and, and they are looking at a really big planting program as well. So they will be assessing 
all the data they've got to see where they can do that and, and liaising with all the local authority partners and other landowners in uh, the Mersey Forest area, which is uh, Cheshire and Merseyside. So yes, the short answer is they are doing something similar in that they are looking to place as many trees as they can in that area as possible uh, if this funding bid comes off. Uh, so Pete, so yeah, let's, um, um, from Sonia's asking, do you monitor the number of trees being cut down in Greater Manchester? No, we don't. I mean, I have to say our focus, because we're not, we're not really a pressure organisation, we're an organisation that's focused on delivery. Um, I think if we were a lobbying organisation on that basis, we would need more resources to do that. Um, and I'm not saying that isn't a worthwhile thing, but really our focus has been about getting the trees in the ground and also getting woodlands back into management. So delivery really is our big focus. Um, the, the question from Mike, which sort of fits on, is can you get a preservation order on trees? He doesn't think you can in Lancashire. I don't know why that's something you know about. Um, well, it depends on who owns the land. Um, the local authorities are responsible for their own uh, TPOing of trees on their land. If there's a particular uh, tree on, on private land, you can go to your planning authority and ask them whether a TPO can be put on there or an emergency TPO to protect that tree in the short term until at such time as they determine whether or not it warrants you know, a full TPO to be assigned to that tree. So the thing to do is actually contact your local planning authority because they're the ones that administer that. Um, I'm trying to see. It's a bit diff more difficult on this. To ch I think that's. I think that's most of the questions that um, um, covered. Um, yeah, just to say, there was a, a, a question about recording. It will be recorded. We'll let you know where the recording will sit. Um, I'll download it after we've finished. It's bang on twelve o'clock. So just so that we don't. Um, run over into the next session and they're waiting for people that are here now to get over back to Crowdcast. Um, we've got the one o'clock session now, um, or even 12 o'clock session now, is uh, what if public transport was free? So that's brilliant. Ali's hosting that, so I'm sure he's disappeared off, um, off Zoom and I'm supposed to be doing the um, uh, support box. Yeah, and then so Sonia's just put the link in there so anybody wants to find a quick way to get back um, over to Zoom. Sonia's just put the link in for the next session. So I'm going to wrap it up now and we will make sure you all know where the recording is so you can share it. But at Pete, I just want to say absolutely brilliant. That's great. I mean, I, that data, I um, just love to see that if see what Mersey Forest have got now. So they might be upset with you when I start mithering them about what fantastic data you've got um, over at uh, City of Trees. So brilliant. Great. Thanks very much, everybody. We're going to go offline.